We should be good to go. Um, welcome everyone to uh, HPC user session. Uh, today we have Lara uh, from uh, Sevitar International Research Center. She is going to be talking about the R environment scalability and reproducibility with Docker. And uh, we have had a lot of questions regarding how to set up our environments on Chiha and uh, how can we manage our environments. And I think today's talk from Lara should give a pretty good idea on how you can achieve that, those things in your environment. And even without that, uh, with, uh, even outside Chiha, it's really nice to have a grasp on how you can manage the environments around the software. and. Uh, Hopefully, you guys should get a lot out of today's talk. Uh, with that, I'll let Lara start. All right, thanks, Ravi. So before uh, we jump into the materials that I've shared, so in case you've not noticed, I've put a couple of them in the uh, a link to a series of materials in the chat. Uh, but before we actually touch upon that, I wanted to just share three or four slides to ensure that you understood the terminology that we're going to be using with Docker. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit about Singularity since after all, this is an HPC user session. So that being said, let's go ahead and get started with the slides first. Again, the agenda for today is to first give an introduction to Docker. We're going to talk about some of the containers from the Rocker project. I will explain all that as we go through. We're gonna build and customize a Docker file. We're gonna talk about containers with bioconductor dependencies. Docker Hub, and then finally Singularity. This is the link to, to, the, chat, uh, to the materials. Again, it is in the Zoom chat room. So starting with Docker, this is a very simple overview of Docker. There's of course a lot more into this if you look at the official documentation, but for our purposes today, we're talking about Docker, of course, for managing virtual environment, uh, for, for managing computational environments, right? So. Docker is not the only um, technology used to manage environments. The more classic one is, of course, what probably many of you have used is virtual environments, right? For a lot of computational biologists, uh, you've probably used Conda before, and Conda is, it does more than create a virtual environment, but after all, it does that. And that being said, um, although we're talking about Docker today and Docker has a lot of advantages that I'm gonna go through, I still think the virtual environments play a significant role in today's data science world. Uh, it's easy to you know, install dependencies with virtual environments, start them up. A lot of the current workflow managing systems like Snake, Make, Next Flow can easily integrate virtual environments, but container technology is becoming more and more common and uh, that can also be integrated with uh, other types of technologies like the, snake, the, the workflow, workflow systems that we use in our data science. And mainly the reason why we really want to focus in Docker here is because one major advantage that Docker has or that container technology has over virtual environments is that it encapsulates not only an application, the dependencies, but also the operating system. That's a huge advantage because you really minimize the, the potential issues that can happen when you're trying to get dependencies working in your own computer. Since here, everything is running in an isolated environment and it doesn't even need to be the same operating system that you're running. So for today's session, I am, for example, on a Mac, we will be running containers that, are, uh, that have our studio running on an Ubuntu operating system. So that can really minimize uh, potential issues that you can, uh, can occur among operating systems. In addition to that, it's easily scalable. So again, you can distribute to your colleagues. They can be running the exact same environment. You can um, launch applications, for example, from a server, let's say it's AWS, and you can launch multiple applications from that server without having to worry about installations in the server themselves. You just need to add Docker and then pull the images and run the containers independently. And if an issue does arise during these launches, it's a lot easier to identify, right? What container that's coming from, you can take that container offline and everything else still stays up and running uh, with no issues. It's portable, it's flexible, et cetera. So that being said, before we jump into the materials, I also wanna clarify some of the terminology that you will hear me uh, saying, I've already said probably most of these, which is Docker file, image, and container. Bottom line is that actually all these are linked to each other. A container is dependent upon an image, an image is, uh, is dependent upon a Docker file. So starting with the Docker file, the Docker file is a recipe to developing an image. 
This is where you define dependencies. You can optionally add in source code. You can optionally add in data sets, et cetera, right? So why do I say optionally for source code and that is data sets? That's because ultimately it's gonna depend upon what the goal is for the container that you want to develop, right? Is it to just share environment uh, to, to someone or is it to actually share an entire analysis with the data sets in there? Uh, obviously you wouldn't want to be adding data sets and source code to probably preliminary data, right? Or anything that's not published yet, but maybe afterwards you may want to do that. It's, it's, it's your choice. Uh, for data sets as well, another thing to consider is that uh, you need to think about the size, right? I wouldn't be adding a data set that's too large because that can make the, uh, the image quite large. So just uh, keep that in mind. It's very easy to provide access to those data sets to the container by using mounting. And this is something that we're gonna cover. But there are use cases that perhaps you do want to have that in there. Back to my application example, if you're running, for example, an R Shiny application, since today we're talking about R, it's fairly easy to go ahead and launch everything if um, all the dependencies, including the application itself, is in the container. Now, again, you can still use mounting, but if it's not too large of a data set, you can just add it all in a single container and launch it from there. That being said, if a Docker file is the recipe to developing an image, the image is an immutable layout that defines the container and is, of course, built from a Docker file. Immutable, of course, means that you cannot change it. So if you are launching a container and you realize you want an additional dependency to it and you add that dependency to the Docker file, the Docker file is going to build a separate image. It's not going to be a change to this image. The images are also what's easily shareable online, and they are the ones that are pushed to Docker Hub. So oftentimes we say, oh, I'm gonna grab the container from Docker Hub. Technically it's the image, and then we go ahead and we build and run the container locally. So if image is, if the image defines all the dependencies um, in the, for the container, the container itself is the running instance of the image, right? So when we actually run the command Docker run with the image name, and you have, in our case, the RStudio session uh, running in your browser, that is the container. So hopefully that's clear. Um, if, if not, just let me know. In addition to that, sorry, so since this is after an HPC user session, most of you have probably also heard about Singularity. So what is Singularity? Like Docker, Singularity is also a container platform, but has a key advantage to uh, our user base in the sense that you can run containers in HPC while with Docker, you cannot because Docker requires pseudo privileges for everything. So has regular users, obviously we do not have pseudo privilege in HPC, but Singularity lets you uh, easily um, overcome this issue. Just a, qu a quick note, of course, Jiha has Singularity installed. Uh, you can load that uh, via the module load system for the latest version. And of course you can specify a version via module load as well. Now you may wonder, well, if Singularity allows us to do this, why would we wanna use Docker, right? Ultimately, of course, it's your decision, but a few things to consider is that Docker is compatible with many container platforms. So for Singularity specifically, we can easily convert a Docker image to a Singularity image with a, a single command. So it's very easy to convert the images and then simply run Singularity when you need uh, more resources for HPC. Importantly, although Singularity does not require sudo for running the container, Singularity does require sudo for building the image. So if you want to actually build the image from a Singularity recipe, you need to be doing that in your own computer with Singularity installed locally, just as you would with Docker. So really there, there's no difference. And then really the point that I think uh, is, is quite important, at least for the computational biology community to consider is that Docker has a wealth of resources already available for users to build uh, their images. Sorry, there was a typo here, I meant their images. Uh, so that means that you're just having to do less work, right? To, to, to have your own images uh, up and running. That's not to say that Singularity does not have uh, any, uh, any resources. Of course it does, but it just happens that Docker has a little bit more. Again, nonetheless, it's ultimately your decision to decide which container to run. But we're gonna be covering today the most commonly used workflow for most data sciences use cases, which is to write a Docker file, build Docker images, 
and uh, run Docker containers. And then when necessary, which we will go through today, convert a image and run a singularity container. And again, with a big focus in our use cases, mainly our studio, but it would be very similar if you were to do something for our Shiny as well. Now, one last thing I want to point out in the slides is uh, there are some practical differences between Docker and Singularity that you do want to keep in mind. This article that I have in the slides, which is also in the GitLab link for uh, under part three, and I'll highlight that when we're there, is um, that you know you will notice some difference when you're running the container. Other than a pseudo privilege, obviously, something that Docker does and Singularity does this as well, but Docker does to a higher level is that it really isolates the file system as much as possible. Thus, access to host file systems, such as a directory in your desktop, needs to be given explicitly via the mount flag, right? And we're going to go through this. Importantly, and this is something you will see today, is that Docker isolates the user IDs. So your user ID for your, or your laptop, for example, is not going to show up in, in the container. And this is important because for the RStudio session, we have to log in using a username. We're going to be using the, the default username, and it's not your own username. You can change that. But that's different in Singularity. Singularity does uh, have a few differences. It makes some of the host file systems automatically mounted, such as home and uh, current working directory. Uh, if you look at their documentation, you see that there's a few other ones as well, and that can be changed. But the username that we're going to be using for Singularity containers is our Chiha username. So just be aware of these differences and it will become quite clear once we actually go to the session. So that being said, uh, I will go ahead and switch to the GitLab's um, materials. And starting with part one, if anybody has any issues accessing this, let me know, but it should be public. So starting with part one, the very first thing I want to just briefly mention for our session is Requirements, of course, the only requirement here for the session is to, of course, have Docker installed in your own computer. The, it should be very straightforward, so I'm not going to be going through this in detail, but this link takes you to the installation. All you need to do is just select your own operating system. Also, I have added a couple of getting started documentation from the Docker docs themselves. It's not required, but I, I recommend reading when you have time because keep in mind that today we really have a focus in our use cases, while this set of documentation is a bit more global. And I think it's not that large, it's fairly easy to go through. Uh, and I recommend going through if you've never used Docker before. Overview, other than what I've already said, one thing I just want to briefly highlight is, again, the whole reason why we're talking about Docker is for environment reproducibility for your data science needs. But keep in mind that uh, science uh, scalability and reproducibility is, you know, this is only part of that equation. Always remember that you always need good, good documentation, right? No matter how good of a software you write, no matter how good of a pipeline you develop, it is, it, you know, if you don't have good documentation, if you don't update often enough, it's, you're not doing, you're doing a disservice to your own work. Version control of code is always necessary. I've previously presented a lecture in Git and GitLab. You can check out the PDF slides on this link. Uh, and version control will also apply to us today because when we're developing a Docker file, you, would you do want that Docker file to be committed to the project that you're working with so that as your container image changes, that is also being tracked at the Docker file. And then finally, we have environmental reproducibility, which is what we're focusing on today. So the very first thing that we are going to be doing for this session is to run a container, an RStudio container from Rocker. So just a brief introduction to Rocker. I have a little bit more information here when you can't, when you know you're investigating this on your own time. Uh, as a summary, uh, the Rocker project is essentially uh, a, a collection of Docker containers for the R environment. The team has put a lot of effort developing a ton of images for a lot of R use cases from the basic R installation dating back. I don't quite remember what the version is, but it goes back quite, uh, quite, quite further back to having images with, again, R Studio, to having images for R Shiny, to having images with, for example, R Shiny with Tidyverse installed. So it's really a reliable resource for anybody who's trying to use uh, Docker with R. So be sure to check out today. Again, we're gonna be using one of their images repositories and they have a lot more to, to offer as well. So 
again, the very first thing we're going to do here is just run a basic container with no dependencies installed that we're installing ourselves. That's just a warm up uh, session. But the very first thing that I want you to pay attention to when you're looking at any any repository in Docker Hub is pay attention to the tags tab, right? That's what really determines essentially the version of the image that you're running. The number of the tags will of course vary dependent on, depending on the application that you're using. But for the, for the case of RStudio and most rocker based images, the, the number under tags will correspond to the version of R. Again, you will have to be sure to check this out in their documentation under the overview to review it. But again, in this case, if we say 4.0.3, which happens to be the latest version as well, it, this will be grabbing an R instance of this particular version. And again, they go back quite a lot. You can also, for the Rocker project specifically, they have this in their overview page. You can check out their repositories in GitHub where they explain quite in depth how their, their versions are configured. And essentially they're saying what I just told you uh, that they are corresponding to the, the R version itself, but there are some exceptions. As a matter of fact, you can see in the first line here that there, are, there is a difference that they've recently added for R 4.0 and above. So always check the documentation. This second link is just a link that they have as essentially as a reminder of what version corresponds to when the the, the, the release was done and also what our studio version is present there. So again, for today, we're going to just use the R studio containers. For this first example, we're going to just be running the latest uh, image that they have available. I'm going to go through GitLab and then we're gonna go ahead and switch to the terminal so you can actually see uh, the, the live session, but let's go just section by section, right? So the way that you run a container is with a Docker run command, and then you can optionally add some of these flags and I'm gonna break down, break them down to you in a second. And then of course, the last thing you wanna add is the image name. In this case, we're already grabbing directly from Docker Hub. So you want to go ahead and, and add their username, then the, um, the, the image that you want, and then the, the tag, in this case, the latest tag, okay? So just to quickly break this down, uh, these are some commonly used flags. Of course, they're not all by any means. Be sure to, you know, you can bring in the help section from um, the, the command line, but also read upon the documentation. So dash D runs the container in the background in detached mode. This is an optional flag. I personally like to do this. Dash dash RM automatically removes the container when it exits. I always recommend doing this unless you don't want the container to, to be removed upon uh, stopping the container. Because essentially, if you don't have that in there and you don't remove the container, these containers will actually still be present in the background that can take up computational resources. Dash P is a required flag for running the RStudio container because we do need, after all, a browser, right? The RStudio is a, a, is a GUI interface to it and we need to access that via the browser. So you need to expose a port and bind to the port in the container. The choice of the port number itself will, depend, will vary dependent upon the application. We choose 8787 because that is the default port number for our studio. If you're running a different application, you need to be aware of what that application um, default port number is. For our Shiny, for example, it's 3838. So always check out the documentation. Now, in this case, I ran what, you know, the default is, which is to say 8787, which is required. This is actually my own port number. It does not need to be 8787. It could be anything else because I have a bunch of port numbers available. So you can change this one, but normally uh, people just match it up. But there may be times that you might need to change. If you're using a shared resource where port numbers are gonna get busy, you may need to know a specific port number to use. And then last is the password. This use should not be a requirement, but now is for the rock for most rocker image uh, images, which is to just provide a password for the R Studio session. The, the standard username is R Studio. You can change that if you want, but for our demonstrations today, we're not going to change it. And finally, once you run that command, you then you can then access the R Studio session in your browser with the local host and the local port number. So if I had changed this here, if I had said 8387, it would have been local host 8387, okay? This is not the, the port number from the container. 
And before I actually do the demo for this, the live demo, just so you can see, I just wanted to briefly mention that we're just, this container is just the base, right, image for our studio. There's obviously no, nothing installed there. You can, of course, go ahead and install something if you want. So let's say you want to install ggplot2. You can, but the moment you exit the container, uh, it will no longer be there. That's where Docker files come in. There is technically a way to write an image from a ongoing session. We're not going to explore that so much today because I have a high preference to, you know, writing Docker files. But if this is something that is of interest to you, the way you do this is by the Docker commit uh, uh, command. And you can actually explore this documentation, which I, th I thought was quite good. They actually have a few other topics in here. And they described how you can actually save an image from uh, a container that you may have modified. Uh, just again, just be aware. And if you have any questions about that, feel free to ask me. And the last thing we want to do is, again, once you're done with the container, just be sure to stop that container from running. So let's go ahead and just briefly, before we move on to the next session, just run this in my local computer so you can see. One difference is for the sake of time for today's session, I do have all these images already locally because they can take actually quite a lot of time to build. Uh, so the only difference you will see between what, what may be here and what I'm doing is that things are not getting built from scratch. Uh, but that's just to save us some time. So if I go ahead and I run the, the container from the Rocker project, it will go ahead and start. So if I do Docker image OS, you'll see that indeed I have this container. I have a few other ones in here, of course, but the, um, the latest image of our studio is in here. One thing I wanted to point out though, is you can see that of course these images take up space, right? So be aware of that, right? If, you're, if you have an image that you're not gonna be using, then there's no point in keeping them locally cached. Go ahead and clean it up. Like this image, for example, I'm not using 4.0 quite yet. So I'm probably just gonna remove it and I will just bring it back whenever I do need it. Uh, so just bottom line is, you know, this is not so bad, but you don't wanna have like 200 images in your computer. Uh, that will probably take a lot of space. For the container, since we're already running again, the command for you to see is docker ps. You can also have this dash a, this, this is to show all containers, whether they're running or not. And you will see how that can be helpful in just a second. So since that's running and we're, we have local port 8787, our RStudio session will then be present in local port 8787. Here we put the default username and the password that I provided in there, which is capital MBI. And the session should be on, and here it is, right? So this is the exact same screenshot that I have it. In GitLab, you can see that it says version 4.0.3, session info will tell us a little bit more, but you can see already this is Linux and indeed it is an Ubuntu operating system. One last thing I wanted to, of course, show is the, the in addition to the, the dependencies as well, if you go to just the terminal and we just print the current working directory, indeed we are in also a directory that obviously doesn't exist in my computer. This is a directory within the RStudio container, which is the home directory for the RStudio user. So hopefully that's clear. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the next section where we actually want to start adding dependencies to it. So I closed the browser session, but that doesn't mean the container stopped. You have to actually manually stop them. So if we go ahead and we go to PS, the shade is still there. So to stop the container because I don't wanna have a bunch of containers accumulating, I'll say stop. And then this actually stops the container from running. Give it a second. And then now it no longer is there. Just to demonstrate the dash dash rm flag, uh, if I were to have run that exact same container without this flag, what happens is it will work perfectly fine, right? So we'll just run this. There it is. I'm not going to bring up the, the browser again. If I show it's running, now if I stop this and I'm using the container ID, you can also use the name. This is a name that you can change. I personally just like dealing with the IDs more. Docker stop. The container will stop. However, that container will still be present. 
This is why I like to use the dash A flag sometimes when I know there might be something in the background. You can see that indeed it shows that the container is still present even though it exited. If I don't have the dash A flag, I don't get to see that. So just be aware that there can be containers in the background. If you did that and you don't want the container to be present, you can remove it and then you'd wanna use the Docker container. Or, and then if you do a dash dash help, you can see you know, everything that is linked to this command, but you just want to do dash rm and then the ID of this container. And now Docker, Docker, yes, dash a, and now you can see that everything is clean. So again, that was just to, to demonstrate that uh, including that flag can be helpful just so you don't have a bunch of containers accumulating. Uh, also, you can run more than one container from the same image at a time. So I could have two R instances running. The one thing that is important to keep in mind is that if you do want to, to have two containers running from R Studio, you need to provide another port number here because you 8787 will be busy. So if I do want to have another one running, just provide a different local port number. All right, so now on to the next section, which is to write a basic Docker file. Again, Docker files are extremely useful to actually building images uh, or adding layers from an existing image. In this particular example, what we're gonna do is that we're actually not going to use the latest RStudio image. We're going to be using uh, version 3.6.3. Uh, and again, this is because we want that particular R version. And we want to go ahead and install ggplot2, which is a CRAN package, right? So we want to keep, I'm keeping just simple examples here, but you can see how you can easily scale that to real use cases. So to build, to make a Docker file, first and foremost, note up here in that repository, you can clone this to your local computer. You know, the Docker file is named Docker file, right? That's just the default name, just to clarify, no extension and for the basic directives that you want to include is the from. This is defining the base image with the version that you want. And then you, uh, very commonly used directories run. I'm adding this here as an example. I'm just making a directory within the container for my data plots. I'm making another one for mounting. This is technically not required because it will create by default if you don't have something in there. But again, that's just as an example again. If I want to add files or data into the container, you want to use the copy directive. So this is a script that I have locally in this repository. I want that script to be present in the container. So you just copy that into the container. I'm specifically copying into the directory that I created here. And I'm doing the same with this small data set just to make a simple plot where I'm adding the, the whole directory, everything inside of it to this data underscore plots subdirectory. And last, of course, we want to add our ggplot2 dependency. And you just use, once again, the run command, but with the, 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 the standard method that you do this, if you are installing a package in R from the command line, which you use the syntax, and then, of course, the install doc packages function, and then, of course, the package name. Uh, again, this is relatively simple. There's a lot more uh, directives for Docker files. So be sure to check out their, uh, their official documentation, depending on what you need. Uh, but overall, this should at least get you started with uh, starting to create some of these basic environments for yourself and then build upon more complex environments. So once we have the Docker file, what we want to do is then we then need to build the image. That's why when I show the slides, I said, you know, an image is dependent upon a Docker file, container is dependent upon an image. So we first build the image from this Docker file using the Docker build command. Once again, these flags just keep things clean. And the dash T flag is to tag the image. If you don't tag, it's just gonna automatically give you the latest tag. But I do recommend giving a specific tag. In this case, I'm following the rocker standard to provide the tag number corresponding to the R version. That's really totally up to you. It may not make sense depending on your use case. So just make something that makes sense for what you're doing, right? And then of course, this is an, a name that you provide. And then the dot is to indicate that the Docker file is in the current working directory. So be sure to be there. Once we run this command, things are gonna start building. There's gonna be a lot more output than this because what happens is that as soon as this happens, R is gonna open up and the ggplot2 installation is gonna start and that can actually take quite a, quite a while, right? Because ggplot has a lot of dependencies. 
Once we build that, then we run the command using the exact same command that we used for the original latest uh, RStudio um, image from the Rocker project. And then here it is, right? So I'm gonna show you, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the terminal so we can see this in more detail. So let's start by just running the, the build, uh, which I'm, again, I do have this locally built just, just for the sake of time. But uh, realistically, if you were doing this by, for the first time, it would take a lot longer. So just making sure we are in the current working directory from this repository in my local computer. Here's the exact, exact same Docker file. So if I just run this and it's the same image, it's just gonna find it that it's already there and it's not gonna rebuild. If you make a change to the Docker file, it will rebuild, right? It's gonna start adding those additional layers. It will use whatever it can use locally and then add your additional changes to it. And then now if we go ahead and we run in the exact same form as before, the only thing we're changing here is the, the actual image name that we, that we just created. Then we can now access our RStudio ses um, session in our browser. Again, localhost. Log in again. And then now right away, you can see that we now have switched from 4.0.3 to 3.6.3. It still is, of course, running under an Ubuntu instance, uh, sorry, uh, operating system. But you can also see that in addition to the R changes, we now have these directories that were created from from what we define in the Docker file. You can ignore this directory. This is a directory that's a derivative of an older Docker software. Uh, it really doesn't affect the, the, the environment itself. It just, it will always be there if the original developers created this image using the older Docker software. Uh, it was a, a called Kinematic. It's essentially Docker desktop, but the older version. But for Docker plots, here are the files that we have in the GitLab repository. Here is the, um, the script, of course, so I can easily recreate the script that I, the figure that I re originally created with this um, sample data set. And there it is. It's just a basic um, data set about, I believe, books, because we're not, we don't want to do real data analysis here. <laughs> And then if we go back though, the other data, the other directory that I created for mounting is empty. So now I'm going to rerun this container, but we actually want to mount something to it. So this is what we're gonna do next. Let me stop this container. And again, for mounting, just kind of go back here to the materials the only thing you need to do is to provide the path and how that is, and, and then the remote location with this dash V flag. So it has to be the syntax, right? Dash V local directory to remote container directory. I am going to use this specific directory. If that was not created in the container, it's actually not a problem. The container will go ahead and create that for you. I just did it as um, just something that I always do myself, but it's not a requirement. So again, we're going to do the current working directory. I just want to make sure again, the directory that I want to mount is this one. So we should see this file in there, which was not present before. And then again, rerunning that container. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because realistically speaking, this is probably what for most of you who are using RStudio, if you're just pulling an environment, there it is. If you're pulling an environment, obviously that it, uh, uh, like an environment somebody else created, obviously your data sets are not gonna be in there, right? And you don't need to create a whole new image to just give access to some local files. You just need to mount. So it's quite an important concept for the uh, RStudio use case. So that's all I wanted to add in before we move forward. If, there, if anybody has any questions, feel free to interrupt. Um, Mounting, mounting a directory is more useful when you have a data uh, or underlying data set that might keep changing, but mm -hmm. the something might not change. So you can just keep the script in your Docker image and keep the data set outside and only mount that folder. That's absolutely correct. It's definitely more useful. Uh, sometimes there may be cases that you do want to add something there. If you're distributing and it's finalized, like an application, like our shiny applications may not change as much. Uh, and if you're trying to handle that in a server, it's just it may be easier. But I 
definitely see the mounting has the most commonly used case, not just because data set changes, source code for data analysis can also change very often. So mounting is certainly going to be the most utilized uh, use case, not just for Docker, but for Singularity as well, okay? So that's a good point. Sure. Okay, so moving on to part two, this is containers with bioconductor dependencies. There is a reason why I went ahead and I made a separate section for bioconductor. And it essentially comes down to the fact that bioconductor actually has their own set of images. And the reason for that is because bioconductor has actually a lot of dependencies. Why you can technically take one of the rocker um, images and install bioconductor dependencies in, uh, in, to that image, you're also gonna have to go ahead and add everything else that bioconductor needs. So to facilitate that process, the bioconductor team themselves have built a lot of images. So take that to your advantage, use whatever is already available. And in, in this case, I highly recommend you to use their images. And the truth is that if you look at the bioconductor team images, you will see that the base image they're using is actually from the rocker team. They're just adding the bioconductor dependencies already. They do have an official set of documentation, which once again, I recommend for you to go ahead and read through it. It's quite clear and they provide a few other use cases, something that I'm not showing here, but it may be very, it may be needed for your real analysis. We're only showing a, um, the addition of our dependencies, but if you need something else, like let's say you need a Python dependency to run a specific package, you can of course add that and you would add that to the standard form you normally do in your computer. So they show this example where they are adding the TensorFlow, which is can be installed via pip. So be sure to check it out because they are showing you this, this different use case, which will likely be something that you have to do in your own use cases. But again, to highlight some of the important information, just a quick note that they have actually recently changed the container architecture. That link has that information. This is really just to make life easy for us uh, as users and developers so that we can easily extend these images. And importantly, this is why I started the previous section by highlighting the tags. For the bioconductor images, the tag number is corresponding not to the R version, but to the bioconductor release version. So that's why every time you're looking at Docker Hub, be sure to read the documentation because this is definitely something that's gonna change from image to image. Now, what bioconductor release version do you wanna use? That depends upon what version, uh, not just for R do you have, but for the packages themselves, right? So bioconductor is actually very organized in the way that they release packages. It's always very like uh, moving forward together. So it's not too hard to determine this, but if you're not aware, of how, what release releases do you need? Just be sure to check out their release schedule and they have it quite well detailed where they have the release date, they have the, the, um, the release number, they have what release number corresponds to what R version. So if we want to stick to 3.6, you know, given that that's what we're working with, we would wanna use one of these two. Which one do we wanna use? depends again, is there a difference in the package version that made a big difference? That's gonna depend upon what you're doing. And you can check what packages are in that particular version by simply exploring the packages installed here and you can search and, and then just determine based on that. So for our example, what we're doing is again, I wanna to stick to 3.6. We're not looking into like any particular versions. This is gonna be D62, but I'm okay with whatever 3.10 has but we're selecting 3.10 because it's, it runs on 3.6.3 uh, for R. So again, the changes in the Docker file will be to change our base image. One change that's not related to Bioconductor, I just wanted to add it in here as an example of the fact that of course, Docker files have many more directives that you can use is the label directive. This adds metadata to the image and it can be quite useful because as things get more complex, you may wanna add, of course, some metadata. So things like the maintainer, description, et cetera. And not only do you get to see this in the Docker file, you can actually pull that information from the image with the Docker uh, inspect command. So if you do Docker inspect container ID, you pull everything from there. And then again, just, just making a directory there, which is not required, but you can. And then of course we're running the, um, 
the, the installation commands, in this case, using the bioconductor specific function from BioC Manager. And we didn't need to worry about installing this because we're using the bioconductor image from the rocker project. If you did not have any bioconductor dependencies in there, you need to make sure that that is actually something that you're installing. So we're just using this makes life a lot easier if you are using bioconductor dependencies. So here, the sig 2 Pasilla, I'm running a second run command for install packages. For those of you who use R, you know that you can install this with this function as well. I'm just running it separately, just as an example that you can run multiple commands like this. It doesn't need to be all in one. So if for some reason you do need to use another type of install function, that's fine. Like Bioconductor shows, you can use something that's not R related like pip install, et cetera. So let's go ahead and run this one. Again, uh, we first have to run the build and then we run the, the, the container themselves. In this case, I am actually showing exactly what Ravi said. If this is a real d to analysis, you probably don't have the data in there and you probably don't really want to add that in there. You're just wanting to pull the environment. So I am using the data from the Pasilla package because this is a simple example, but the, the script itself for the d analysis, I have it outside of the container. So we are going to be mounting it. And let's now do that section in just for demonstration purposes. Again, I'm going to be running the Docker build command. That's just so that you see that in our case, it will be cached locally. I mean, it's not going to rerun because it's cached locally. But if this is the first time you're doing this, it will start from scratch. And it's going to take quite a while because DC has quite a lot of dependencies. But just be patient. If that's the case. So. Docker file, there it is. So if I run this, it will, of course, detect, and we already have it. And indeed, Docker image LS shows that I do have this image already present. So now if we go ahead and we run this command, this, this container, and we want to mount the directory, this the directory that contains the script, I want to go ahead and use the dash V flag. So we're going to do this. And there it is. So it's my current working directory and the subdirectory. And now, once again, pulling up the local host. And now you see that once again, we do have the same R version, but you can see it already that this is Bioconductor. It has bioconductor dependencies because bioconductor is actually warning you, hey, this is not the latest version. And that's fine, that's what we expect. And then here's our directory that I added the R script. So this is in my local uh, my local uh, folder, my, my local desktop, but um, Docker is finding it. So if I just run a run something really quick, it will be present here. And actually, I don't, I don't point this out, but I just thought about it. Another important thing about mounting, right, is that it lets you write files to your local file system. So for something like DSeq, where you do want to be saving uh, your outputs to your local host, mounting is very important. So if this is a real analysis, I'm just running some a basic one and I don't save the results, but if I were to say write.csv, put that object in there, the file would show up here and it would show up in my own that in my own computer. So that's quite important, right? So just as an example, if I were to, for example, for example, for how many times do I need to say example? <laughs> if I were to just open that up and go to part two, and I'm just gonna add a quick file here. Let me see. Okay, okay I'm gonna I'll ask you that. If if we add a small file to directory for mounting, would that show up in yeah, it would, yeah, that's right. So I, here's the file. There it is, this is just a, a PNG file, but there it is, it shows up in the container and then vice versa. So if I write something here, it's gonna show up. So this is again, quite good because if you have data sets that you wanna just quickly add into the container, maybe you forgot, this is just much more flexible. Yeah, and ultimately the result that you get out of this entire analysis, you might have to mail it out to someone or you might have to put it up on box or something and then you have it in your local system outside of the container space as well. That is correct, absolutely. And then there it is. This was just a basic analysis using a Pacilla data set, but this is the, the object that we expect to see. I plotted a PCA and we see there. So if I were to save that PCA, it should work. Yeah, right, we can do that and then save it. 
the directory, d 6 analysis, choose, save, files, there it is. So, and there it is in my local computer. So you can see how that's quite flexible and definitely useful. So hopefully that's clear as well. I believe that's all I wanted to show for the this particular container. Yes. So let me go ahead and stop it. Before I forget, once again, I just want to make sure I stop the container from running. And going back here, I'm not going to live demo this section, but it's very straightforward. But if anybody has questions, again, an important component of Docker images is, of course, that they're very easily shareable. And the easiest way of doing that is to push them to Docker Hub. Uh, this link has uh, very good instructions. It's extremely easy, uh, but I've kind of summarized them in here. Of course, that the very first requirement is to, I didn't write it down, but it's a given, you need to have a Docker Hub um, uh, a Docker Hub um, ID, right? And they do have uh, a paid, you can pay for to have more private repositories or the free version, I think gives you one private repository and then everything else is public. So do of course what's best for you. But once you're in Docker Hub, all you need to do is say, click on repositories, create, give a name. And then in your own computer, what you wanna do, the only really requirement is to ensure that your local image matches this required syntax, which is the Docker ID. So in my case, it would be LINOV, and then the repo repository name that you gave on the create and then a tag. So in my case, if I wanna push this, which I already have, as you can see here, that I gave the repository name exactly as it was originally named as the image, but then I need to give my ID. So that's what I did. Of course, here, I'm just keeping it general. And then once you retagged that, you can then push with the Docker push command and it will then be online. And of course you can add information under the manage repositories tab that you're gonna have has the, develop, has the original developer of this image. Uh, so again, I'm not gonna demonstrate this because I already have it up and it's very simple, but if somebody has a question on this, please let me know. And then the last section, that we want to cover, of course, which is very relevant for this user session is how do we run an image in HPC, right? Making sure this is good. Okay, so we should be good there. So like I said earlier during the slides for running a container image in HPC, we're going to be using Singularity for all the reasons I already talked about. And the easiest way to, to run this, given that, of course, we need a, we need a browser, if we didn't need a browser like we do for our studio, you could just run in any, any container uh, in the terminal, right? But this is not the case here. We need to have uh, a port number, et cetera. So the current, the current way that's the easiest for the UAB HPC cluster is to use a VNC session. If you look online, you know, this is going to vary uh, widely depending on what uh, HPC system people are using it. Um, so, and this is something that Ravi may actually end up uh, developing some more later. So if you do have another good way of doing this, uh, I will be sure to update this documentation. But for today's session, we're just gonna be talking about using this in VNC. So I think that Ravi has talked about this quite a lot. I think most of you are already familiar with how to start a VNC session, but the instructions are here. We're gonna go ahead and live demo this as well. The one thing you do want to do once you launch VNC is that you want to go ahead and load the Singularity module. In this particular case, I loaded whatever was latest that happened to be 3.5.2. Uh, and then you just want to go to a, a directory. For this demo, I did user scratch. But of course, realistically speaking, if you're going to want to keep a container for a long time, you probably want to use user data. And then the important command that really converts the Docker image to a singularity image is the singularity pool command with the, the repository. This will pull and it will convert from Docker to singularity. And the singularity image is has this extension .sif, right? So one thing that I want to emphasize is that this is not the URL, right? It has this particular syntax here. Sometimes I've seen people get confused and put the URL in here and that's not the case. 
Um, and then once you have that up and going, you can go ahead and start the container. Of course, since we're using Singular, it's gonna be a little bit different, but the concept doesn't change much. Once again, we wanna provide the password. We're providing as an environmental variable. We use Singular Execute, the image name, and then we use this, this does not change. It's essentially saying, let's start up the R server. This uh, section is linked to the fact that we're providing a password. And then this is the web address, which is the local host. And everything else will essentially be different there will be some differences which I'm going to highlight, and I'm going to leave that actually for the uh, the live demo session. So let's go. Gonna, I'm going to go ahead and do this first, and then I'll touch upon the mounting with Singularity as well. But I just want to at least start this part. So going to on demand. Just change this real quick. Just one second. I need to. Authenticate this. So again, starting a VNC session, interactive app, HPC, choosing just something in the express partition, and we're going to launch and just wait in the queue for a few seconds, probably. Okay, so the session starting. We launch. So here's a VNC session. Uh, for those of you that don't use VNC much, right? Actually, I think most omics um, biologists in campus don't use VNC a whole lot. I know the neurobiology community uses this quite a lot. But this is, again, just to give us this interface to Chiha. And it can be, of course, very useful for the singularity use cases. This is actually the only reason why I use VNC. I don't use it for much else, which is not true for all their computational biologists com communities. But the way you start a terminal here is you just go to applications terminal. And then again, we're going to go ahead and load the, I want to load the exact same singularity version just in case. I believe that it still is the latest one, but I'm gonna go ahead and copy the exact same version. I'm gonna copy in here. And, and then, oops, sorry, I mentioned the module list. And there we have it, right? So now I'm gonna to go to the scratch directory that I already have present. By the way, I noticed that uh, Anaconda has singularity softwares as well. So if you create an Anaconda environment, you can uh, load if a new, whenever a newer version. I think there might be a version or two newer than this 3.5.2 of singularity. So if you have a Conda environment, you can create, uh, get the latest singularity software as well. Uh, so I, I, I guess I missed the first part. You said that the latest Conda environment has singularity. So, so Conda has singularity software available in the repo as well. So if you create a Conda environment, you can install singularity directly in your virtual Conda environment. Okay, that's good to know. I was unaware. Good information. So in that directory, in this my scratch folder. Uh, I already have, again, the, the, the image is present, but that's really just to save us time. Just to demonstrate the, the command that we would use, I'll go ahead and run it. Singularity will, of course, know that this is something that's already present. They're going to show it as a fatal error, but it's, of course, you know, that's just because of the error message that's shown. So we're just pasting this in here. And then we're going to... Normally, if I didn't have it, it says image file already exists, will not override it, but otherwise it would of course just pull and do the conversion. So now that we have this to actually start the container, we're gonna run that exact same set of commands that I had it earlier. I'm copying and pasting because it's extremely long. I don't wanna be typing all this. But it doesn't change, right? The concept doesn't change from what, um, we did it in Docker. We're still providing a password. We're telling local hosts 
we're giving the image name, etc. So if we go now to the, uh, the browser right here, localhost, there it is, exact same thing. So one difference, however, is that in Singularity, you do not want to provide our studio username. You actually provide your own Shiha username, which in my case, it's that. But we do want to provide the password that we provided in the command, which is MBI. It's not the Chiha password. But otherwise, so that's one difference, right? That's why I mentioned the slides that the user ID is much more well isolated in Docker than it is in Singularity, and Singularity does this on purpose. In addition to that, you should also note that this looks different, right? This is because this is my home directory in Chiha versus the home directory for the R Studio user. That doesn't mean that you don't have access to the R Studio user, quite the opposite. So here you have LINOV and you still have R Studio user. So I specifically pulled this container because even though, like I said, realistically speaking, you're probably gonna be using mounting, which in this case is binding to access data sets, et cetera. If you do have a file that you that is in the container and you want to access it, it will still be in the exact same directory that was in the in the original container for our for the R Studio user. So we if we go to just home, we will then now see two users, my own and our studio. So everything that was in the container is still is here. And then this is the exact same same file, so we can go ahead and run and it will work exactly the same. So that's really just, just one th difference to be aware of is this file path system. In addition to the file path, in addition to home, like I said, the current working directory is also mounted. So if I go to my scratch directory, you will see that indeed that is in there. So I'm gonna go to the scratch and you will see that this is the subdirectory in the in in the scratch folder that is mounted now that's not the only uh direct that i have in scratch because i have a lot of analysis ongoing since uh, i'm a core director i actually do have more but they're not present in here right and that's that's done on purpose right singularity is not opening up your entire file system to the container so if you do want something else then you would want to just go ahead and provide it has mounting so that's what i'm going to talk about next let me just minimize this And I would just probably just show this if anybody wants me to, to demonstrate this, they can, but it's relatively straightforward. It's exact, it's running the exact same command with essentially the mount flag, which in singularity is called bind. So let's just skip down here where I discussed this. So if I were to again say, I want to mount this path in my scratch, which is different from the current working directory, this is all I'm adding. I'm adding the, the path and there are two ways of doing this. So I'm kind of talking about the distinguish the, the differences here. You can use bind in the same form that the Docker requires, which is to talk to, to uh, say the local directory and the remote directory. If I run it in this form, then the data that is in this path will be located in my, in my R Studio directory, right? Because I specifically established this link. But in Singularity, you really don't need to do that. It's just a lot simpler to just provide the user scratch path. And now you can access that data with the Chiha path. You don't need to worry about providing this. So again, just something to be aware. Uh, this is one of those practical differences that I was trying to uh, emphasize earlier. And just to make sure that I didn't skip over anything important here, again, I talk about the username. In Docker, again, the standard username is RStudio. If for some reason you were to wanna change that, you can do that in Docker with the dash E flag again, but dash U with the user variable and then provide a username. But in Singularity, it will always be by default your Chiha username. So one other thing is Singularity cached. Everything is also cached and the default location is in user data inside this hidden directory. So if you wanna check that out, you just need to run singularity cache list dash V. And to remove it, you use cache clean. I kind of recommend you always do a dry run before you remove it. And I just talk a little bit about this. I don't, I don't currently want to remove my images, so I'll leave them there. And then just to wrap it up, because I really wanted to also mention, right, that I focused a lot today in our studio use cases, but of course there is singularity and Docker, et cetera. They're used for a lot more than just R including more than just our studio. So just a quick note on these other use cases, right? So first and foremost, right? 
I can use these containers knowing that they are they were built uh, from an Ubuntu operating system, I can of course run any command that I want by just running the container and then providing uh, a command after the container name. So this is useful. The reason why I, I'm portraying this, of course, we're just running a, a quick echo command here, but this is extremely useful, for example, for the computational biologist community who wants to be pulling, pulling containers or pulling images, right? For, for containers that have command line tools. So a, a common tool, for example, is SAM tools. SAM tools have images available. So if I wanna run SAM tools in Docker or in Chiha uh, with Singularity, you can do this and you will do it in a similar fashion where you're running the container and then you just provide the same tool specific commands. So you would say in this case, Docker run, container name, and then I can say sim dash view dash h bam file, right? To, to look at the bam file. Uh, and note that here, I just have the dash dash rm because I don't want to necessarily run this in detached mode. I want to actually be seeing the output. And I do not, I'm not providing a port, a dash p uh, flag because we don't need that, right? It, these are just command line based um, programs. And it's very heavily used as well. So that's something to be aware of. So just as an example, since we're using this container, I ran a quick R computation. Uh, and this is how, for example, I'll normally do this. I'll, obviously for R, this is not super useful. We're probably gonna be using R Studio, but that's just to demonstrate that use case. Um, also I have, uh, I think that in the past, Ravi has actually demonstrated this quite well with Singularity. So the documentation from, from the research computing uh, group goes through that exactly. So this is, for example, how we could, you know, interactively run something from a Singularity container. I think the only difference here is that this extension is the older extension from Singularity, right, Ravi? This is from an older version. But yeah. Over yeah, the extension changed in, um, after version three. So this one was as image and Ceph is basically Singularity image file. So. Exactly, yeah. And then they also have an example script of how you do this in a bash script, for example, right? Where they're, you, all you need to do, everything else will be the same. You just load Singularity. Yeah, this is for 2.61. And then you can execute a command uh, within the container by using this. Dash B is binding as well. So it's just another flag. So he's, um, he is here mounting the user data directory. Just a quick note on that because it's extremely useful for you as well. And before I go through this again, back on R, I also think that container is extremely useful for R Shiny applications. In particular, one reason is when you're developing R Shiny, of course, you're, you're launching the application locally, but then when you're ready to publish, you probably want to put it online somewhere, right? So there are a couple of solutions for that. A common use solution is to use R Shiny app, uh, shinyapps.io which is from the R Studio team. But there are limitations with that because, for example, one of the limitations is computational resources, right? They, they are limited on how much flexibility you have. So the alternative there is to launch this from an AWS server, or if you're trying to develop internally, perhaps you're using OpenStack, but then to actually launch this application online there are more dependencies, right? Not only do you need R installed, you need Shiny installed, you actually need the R server dependencies installed. And that can be quite of a, has a hassle when you're trying to install, you know, it's not difficult, but it's very laborious work to always have to do this with a new server and different instances. And Docker solves this in great, I mean, it's, it's, it's like magic, right? It's, it's super easy to actually launch the, the application from a Docker container where all the R server dependencies are already installed and all you need to do is to just add the, the dependencies for your application. So it would be, if I have an application that's running Sura for single cell analysis, I'm just adding Sura and anything else that I'm trying to add to the application, you can go ahead and add the application itself inside the container, but overall very straightforward. The only thing I'm also pointing out, uh, and again, I didn't write a lot here because I don't, I didn't want to deviate too much from an introduction, but when you're running the container, remember I always said, you know, it's probably a good idea to run with dash dash RM for an interactive application, like an R Shiny app that you want to be online and where we want to be up and running online. You don't want to use that, right? Because you do not want the container to exit or, and be removed. Quite the opposite. There is a, there is a flag in Docker, um, docker run dash dash help, 
that you should be aware of. And this probably goes for any container that needs to be hosted online called restart. Yeah, restart. And this, you probably do want to use that. What this does is that if the server restarts automatically, which is going to happen because these cloud systems will sometimes reboot and it's outside of your control, uh, the container will be restarted automat automatically. If you don't have this, then the, the container will exit and then the website will no longer be online. But with this, it resolves that issue. Again, you don't want to use a dash dash rm flag because it's going to conflict. And then the string is a variable that, that if you read into the documentation, you'll see, I think there's three options. It's just, it's like either always, always restarts or restart upon a specific condition. Uh, but just an FYI to be aware for our shiny use cases. And of course, there's a lot more that you may also want to explore for this command. And just a few additional learning resources because what we we're only able to cover introduction material today. By default, Docker only uses a subset of your computational resources. So if you want to, to actually use more, be sure to check out the Stack Overflow uh, post. Essentially, you can change that very easily to the Docker desktop interface. You can go to the dashboard, uh, which I actually didn't show because I don't use it so much, but you can actually see all your images through here and actually run them as well. But if you go to preferences, you can then change the resources utilized. Uh, and then of course, if it exceeds the resources from your local machine, then that's where you go to uh, singularity. And then you can also restrict as well, right? Within you saw a little bit in here with the flags, you can also restrict how much memory to use and et cetera. So be sure to check this out as well, depending on your use case. Uh, this following link is also a little bit of an introduction material, but they cover a little bit of on the utilization for AWS. So if that's something that you will need to do, be sure to check that out too. Another point I didn't cover so much, just due to time, is that you may also need to, to consider that when you're installing a package, especially if it's a CRIM package, you may need a specific version of that package because unlike Bioconductor, you don't run into this issue as much with Bioconductor because of the way that they, they are very organized with their release schedule. And if you choose the, the, the release number, you should be getting the correct package version, but with CRAN, it may not happen, right? So with CRAN, you probably, if you really need a specific version because there may be a, a bug fix and that, that's not the default version, you may consider using a install version function, like an example is from the remotes packages where you're talking about the package name and the package version. Of course, that you have to, be sure that you're choosing a version that is correspondent to the R version that you're selecting. Uh, but just wanted to make sure that that point was mentioned. This is a, an interesting, um, you know, a nice little article that a colleague shared and I just wanted to put it in here, 10 simple rules for writing Docker files. And then if you have also last but not least, if you end up encountering that in Chiha with Singularity, uh, you find that your home directory is filling up, which can happen, especially if you are uh, if you end up having large data sets. Ming Tang, who's a fellow bioinformatician, uh, he actually has um, co covered this in detail at the very end of this post. So just be sure to check this out if you do run into that issue. Um, but that's all I've got. I think that we've got maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes left. So I wanted to leave that up for questions. Any questions? I guess not. <laughs> I'm just checking the chat out. I totally missed whatever was in here. Oh yeah, by the way, so this one, was, this was a very interesting uh, talk. And uh, so, uh, this session would be available on YouTube after after the session as well. And uh, I posted the link for the YouTube channel. It's basically going to be a research computing channel on YouTube. And I posted the link where you can find this session later on when you guys might be trying out some of these things on your own. Uh, yeah, so feel free to go in and check out that uh, as well. Are there any questions that you guys have? Uh, 
All right, then. Uh, thanks, Lara. This was really, really interesting. I really liked all the concepts that were introduced over here from Docker to our studio, our environment, and then Singularity. Um, I think this should be really useful for people, uh, especially when they come on to their, uh, I guess, staging stage of their data and stuff with our shiny and everything. I think uh, having familiarity with Docker would be really useful at that point as well. Exactly, it's, uh, I think certainly useful. And like I said, you know, for our studio in Chiha, obviously you do, you do have the R Studio app configured, which technically does run in a singularity co container. But really, the decision of whether you're going to use that in your own container comes down to the advantage that with your own container, you can already have dependencies installed, right? Which, if you're starting the R, the R Studio, so I think I said R Studio, I meant R Studio, R Studio app from on demand, you're going to have to install things yourself, right? And that's that's totally fine, right? That's what you want. Uh, you just have to be aware of potential conflicts because things are being installed to, I think, the home directory and you need to make sure that you're perhaps changing that. There's ways to configure that in R, obviously, but I like the fact that with Singularity, at least you, you can just pull and already have things up and going if you've already configured that in the past. And that can be a pretty, pretty big advantage. I agree. Um, so we do have, um... We have enabled sandboxing on on-demand as well that allows you to create your own R Studio interactive app. Uh, I don't think we have any documentation on that. So if anybody wants to set up their own R Studio interactive application, feel free to come to our office hours and talk to us and we can go through some of the things that you might have to copy in your own environment because right now, the on-demand interactive applications are in a shared location and where we have the Singularity container that's running for that particular version. Uh, but if you want to set up your own R Studio applications where you can change dependencies and all those things, um, there are methods of doing that, but yeah, they are just very involved. So, and uh, there was one other method where you mentioned where we um, where we can move from VNC desktop. Uh, though that that's one of the things that we are still trying to develop, where you can just have a command line interface. And, uh, and that be, uh, for those of you who may actually look at that maintain post, because that's what it does. It does SSH tunneling. That's currently not available in Chia, but maybe something that will be added in the future. And uh, you know, just an FYI, if you do look into that, I guess one question: sandbox, because that's something of a new development. Uh, for sandbox, it, would it be how would that be set up exactly? Could it be set up to a Singularity container, that R Studio session, or does it have to be outside? Uh, so, uh, so the sandbox would be sandbox is going to utilize the Singularity container, but it would be outside. Uh, it, it, the entire thing is not going to be a Singularity container. It's going to utilize the Singularity container for R Studio that sitting. Uh, not your own, not your own singularity container, right? I mean, you can. So sandboxing means that you have access to a lot of stuff uh, where you can set up your own R Studio container. Right now, the R Studio container that's running, that's something that's central right now. That's why whenever we have to change, we have to take a look at that. It's not disturbing anybody else's workflow if we change something or not. But with sandboxing, you get all the, I guess, uh, permissions and rights or it's it's basically like a sandbox area playground area for you where you can just try to set up any of your r studio containers and and try to access those apps and see that it, the dependencies that you added resolve the issues that you're having with the workflow um, it does require a bit more than a normal interactive app would have especially r studio because um, with R Studio, we have some module files and all those things. This it, this would be a more involved process with rather than what you'll find in our documentation right now, which is for pretty basic apps. But but it is certainly possible. Mm -hmm. Cool. So if nobody else has any question, I would like to thank Lara for the, the wonderful talk, and uh, we'll see you guys next month then. Sounds good. Thanks, Ravi. Bye. Bye.